Hello boys and girls and thanks for joining us today for another Bible Corner. It's Uncle Robert here with you for all of today's meeting. Now let's get off to a good start and we'll sing together the words of a lovely little chorus, One Way God Said to Get to Heaven, Jesus is the Only Way. So whenever we hear the music, let's all perhaps stand up and follow the words and sing our very best. Well done, boys and girls. That was really great singing again. Now, we have our Bibles with us, so we want now just to do another memory verse. And this is a verse that perhaps you have never learned before. So tr I trust that you'll do really well and retain it and use it for the future. It's found in the Old Testament, and it's one of the Psalms. And uh, you set up nicely, and I'll read it through to you one time. The Bible says in Psalm 68, verse 1, Let God arise... Let his enemies be scattered, and let them also that hate him flee before him. So let's have a little go at that together. After two, one, two. The Bible says in Psalm 68 verse 1, Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered, let them also that hate him flee before him. Now, this is quite a difficult verse, so we're going to do a few actions. So I'll pop my Bible down and... We'll do a few actions, so you watch me this time as we say it and try and copy these actions. The Bible says in Psalm 68 verse 1, Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered, let them also that hate him flee before him. Well done. Let's see you doing the actions this time as you say the memory verse along with me. Here we go. After two, one, two. The Bible says... In Psalm 68 verse 1, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered, let them also that hate him flee before him. Very good. Boys and girls, we'll do it one last time. And this time, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to drop out the word where there's an action, but I want you to include the word and do the action at the same time. So let's have a little go at that. After two, one, two. The Bible says in Psalm 68 verse 1, Let God, let his enemies be, let them also that him flee before him. Very good. Well done. Boys and girls, try and remember that little verse. It's a terrific verse and it shows us of the power of God and how he deals with his enemies and he causes them to flee from before him. And we can have the victory in God because of such things. Our next little chorus is one which is called Roll the Way, Roll the Way. And there's loads of action, so you get your rolls all ready. And you can even pop in that little line and never come back if you want to as well. So whenever you hear the music, let's sing our very best together. And don't forget those actions.
Well done, boys and girls. As always, your singing is first class. Now, we're coming to the story, but before we just tell you the story, we want to settle our hearts before the Lord, and we need to ask for his help in this part of the meeting, especially. So let's just sit up nice and quiet. We'll do our little drill. We'll do our ABC. So we'll have our arms folded, our heads bowed, and our eyes closed. And if you want to, you can go right down to Z and put the zipper across as well to remind you to be extra quiet. So let's just pray together. Dear Lord, we come to thee just at this point in the meeting, ever uh, needy as always. And we do ask, O oh Lord, that thou would just help us today, that thou would just bring to your mind all that we would want to say, that we'd be able to bring glory and honour to thy name. We pray that you'll help boys and girls and mums and dads as they tune in, uh, just to be able to understand what's being said and that little ones and older ones will indeed come to thee and trust thee as their saviour today for we ask it in his wonderful name amen boys and girls today we have a story about a man called gideon that's why we did that memory verse about god rising up and scattering all his enemies because this is something that happened in the story of gideon today now, if you don't know it, Gideon grew up in the land of Israel. And at that time, the country had enjoyed about 40 years of peace and safety. You see, they were living in obedience to God and God was blessing them. Sadly, however, things were beginning to change little by little, bit by bit. Israel again was beginning to embrace all sorts of sin and idolatry. And refusing to heed his warnings, God then had to deliver Israel into the hand of the Midianites who came across into their country over the border in their tens of thousands. The Bible says they came and they were like a plague of grasshoppers taking over the whole country. Now being outnumbered, the Israelites didn't put up much of a struggle. Rather, many of them ran away and they hid in the dens and the caves up in the hills, hoping that the Midianites would just come, take what they wanted, and just go away again. But you know what? The Midianites never really did go away. For the next seven years, they kept coming back again and again and again. And every time they began to bring more stuff with them. They brought their cattle and their tents and their families and they spread themselves right across the whole land, taking just whatever they pleased. And you know what? They left very little behind for the poor children of Israel to survive on, to get by on. Boys and girls, what we see here in this part of the story reminds me of what Satan does in the lives of the unsaved. You see, they, like the children of Israel, have turned their backs on God. They have no protection. And they have no help from him when old Satan comes along and he runs amok and takes over their lives. You see, unlike a saved person, the sinner can never say that God is their refuge or their strength or a help in trouble. You know, the old devil delights in you rejecting God and trying to go on in your own strength. Because it's not long before he comes and takes everything else of value and worth in your life. You see, like the Midianites, Satan comes and goes as he pleases. And every time he comes back again, he always, always gets what he wants. And what is that? He wants to drive you further and further from God and deeper and deeper into sin. Like the children of Israel, perhaps today you're downcast and dismayed. You need someone to deliver you from the plight that you find yourself in. Your life is a mess. But the good news is this. A deliverer has been provided. For Israel back in Bible times, it was going to be Gideon. For you today, right now, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only one who can set you free from both your sin and the hold that Satan has over your life. But back to our story. Israel was in a bad way. The people cried on to the Lord for mercy and deliverance. And that deliverance, as I said, came through a young man called Gideon. God came to Gideon one day as he was secretly trying to thresh some uh, corn that he had grown. And he didn't want the Midianites to find out about it. And so he was doing it in secret. And he was so busy that he didn't even notice the Lord in the form of an angel sitting watching him 
from under a big old oak tree. As the Lord began to speak with Gideon, all Gideon was able to do was to complain about the awful state that Israel was now in. And why God hadn't come yet to do a great deliverance and to save the people in some miraculous way, as he had done on other occasions. God then answered Gideon by telling him that he was going to be the one chosen to deliver Israel from the Midianites. Gideon didn't believe it. How could he, a poor man, from a very un unimportant family, do anything to change the circumstances he found himself in. But boys and girls, what Gideon had forgotten was this. God delights to use weak and foolish things to confound the mighty. To convince Gideon of this truth and to reveal his mighty power, the angel then stretched out the rod or the stick that was in his hand and he touched the foodstuff that Gideon had kindly laid out for his visitor. And in that very moment, it was consumed by the fire from God. As his visitor left, Gideon suddenly realized to himself that he had indeed met with the Lord, and that this fire was indeed a sign from God that he would be with him in the battle against the Midianites. Having now put his faith fully in the Lord, having trusted in God, Gideon's newfound faith was going to be put to the test on that very same day, later on that night. You see, whenever he got home, the Lord instructed Gideon to do something. Gideon, go you and pull down the altar that's in your home that your father put up to worship Baal. And when you do that, I want you to build a new altar and it's to worship me, the one true God of Israel. Now, boys and girls, this should be the same for anyone who trusts in God. We all must get rid of anything in our lives or in our homes that would offend God. And the worship of Baal in Gideon's home was very offensive to God. But Gideon was afraid. What would his father say? And what if some of the neighbours might notice this? However, despite his fear, Gideon that same night did as God commanded him. He obeyed. And he broke down and he destroyed that altar to Baal and he set up a brand new altar for the worship of God alone. However, early next morning, his nosy neighbours, they must have been nosy because they noticed the new altar almost straight away and a great row broke out. And they were shouting, whoever did this, they should be put to death. It's a disgrace. Look at that. Now to Gideon's surprise, Support for what he had done came from a very unexpected source, his own father. I think, boys and girls, perhaps realising that he was wrong in having put up this altar to Baal in the first place, Gideon's father came to his son's defence. And he said to the men of the village, and he said to the nosy neighbours, Well, listen, if Baal is real, then let him be the one to punish my son himself. And of course, boys and girls, as expected, nothing at all happened. Because Baal was a false god. From that day onward, Gideon was given a brand new name, Jerubbabel. And that means the rival of Baal. Gideon had learned that despite his fears, by taking his stand for the Lord, that God would be with him as he sought to be a bold witness to all around him. But let's get on with the story. You see, having been put to the test and having been faithful to God in those small things, Gideon was now ready for the world stage. The Midianites had been gathering for weeks and weeks and months and they were filling up the land of Israel. Thousands of them were settling in a camp in the valley of Jezreel. However, upon hearing this news, Gideon's trust began to diminish a little bit. He began to get a little bit anxious and he began to ask God for another, a special sign, one that would definitely prove that God would be with him. See, Gideon's just like you and me. It can be full of fear, and we're only human. Well, that night, Gideon left out a fleece on the ground. And he asked God that in the morning, the fleece would be wet with the morning dew, and the ground round about would be dry. And then he would know for sure that God would be with him. And God did this, just as Gideon asked. But still, those doubts lingered. Oh, it just could have been a coincidence, he might have thought. So the next night, he asked for the ground to be wet 
and the flesh to be completely dry. And the morning, it was exactly as he requested it to be. God had answered his prayer both times. Gideon was now utterly convinced that the Lord wouldn't leave him and that this was a work of the Lord. And thus having been again greatly encouraged and strengthened in his faith, Gideon set out across the land with a trumpet to call upon his fellow countrymen to take up arms and to be willing to fight against the Midianites. Boys and girls, 32,000 men responded to that call and they came ready to fight. However, something strange happened. God then told Gideon, you have far too many men. You see, God wanted Israel to rely on him, not manpower. You see, boys and girls, if the truth be told, perhaps 32,000 very valiant, very bold men might just be enough to defeat this huge army of Midianites. And of course, if they did that, they would end up boasting and bragging about how great they were rather than giving God all the glory, giving God all the honour. God then told Gideon to instruct all those that had gathered that if anyone was afraid, they could go back home that day. Now that all sounds a bit strange, but it is in fact a Bible-based offer. You see, way back in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 20, whenever God gave Moses various rules for the children of Israel, one of them was to do with how they should behave when they went out to battle. And if they went out to battle and came up against an army or a force that was bigger, larger than themselves, one stipulation was this. God allowed the cowardly to go back home again. A very wise thing. Because you wouldn't want to be a soldier and have a lot of jumpy, nervous men around you who were afraid, especially on the battlefield, especially at the very moment you would have needed them. And so it was, boys and girls, that 22,000 men that day went back home. They were afraid. And that left 10,000 to face the Midianites. However, God then said there was too many. Still too many. Having gotten rid of the cowardly men, this time God was going to get rid of the careless men. How did that happen? Well, the remaining 10,000 men were instructed to go down to the riverside and to get a drink of water. This was a test. A test that only some of them would pass. As the men stooped to drink, a large number got right down under their knees and under their tummies and they put their faces right down into the water to catch as much as they could in their mouths as the lovely cold water flowed past. All these men seemed to care about was themselves and how much they could get to drink. They most certainly weren't thinking about the enemy at that time. A very careless thing to do, especially with those Midianites being so nearby. However, 300 men did something different. Just 300. They cupped the water into their hands and brought it up to their mouths and they lapped it the way a little dog would do. Now they probably didn't get as much to drink as the other fellows, but they drank in an upright position and so that they could see the enemy left, right and centre if they were suddenly to come. They were careful and wise, especially with all this danger around them. God then told Gideon that he only needed these 300 men. These were careful men. These were men who were not cowardly and they were there to be used to defeat the Midianites. And then when the time came, under the cover of darkness, God instructed Gideon and his men to creep down and to spread themselves out in a big ring around the Midianite camp ever so silently, ever so carefully, so as not to be seen or to be heard by anyone in the darkness. All they were instructed to carry was what Gideon said, a trumpet in one hand and a bright fiery lamp concealed within a big clay jug in the other. They had no swords, they had no spears, they had no weapons of any kind. Perhaps some of these men might have been a little bit dubious about this, going to battle with no actual weaponry. But in faith they all looked to Gideon and they all trust that God would deliver the Midianites into their hand as he saw fit to do so. And then, boys and girls, at the exact moment, at the right time, when Gideon gave the signal, they all suddenly stood up 
from their hiding places. And they blew those trumpets as loud as they could. And they smashed open the lamps. And they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they kept blowing and they kept shouting. And stunned by the racket. And dazzled by the bright lights that suddenly shone right around the camp. Still half asleep, the Midianites stumbled and tumbled out of their tents. And Gideon's men stood their ground. Now, in their hearts, they didn't really know what was going to happen next. But they stood their ground, depending on the Lord. And then, in all the confusion, the Midianites began to lunge out with their spears and, their sh- and with their swords and at all the shadowy figures around them. And little did they realize it, but they were killing. They were fighting each other. Those that were left standing, seeing all their comrades lying now dead on the ground, not fully realizing what had happened and what was going on, they knew that they had to get out of there. So they began to flee for their lives. They began to run. They needed to get out of Israel before they too would end up dead. And seeing what the Lord had done, Gideon quickly sent messengers on ahead to get the other men of Israel to chase after the Midianites, to cut them off, to stop them before they got back across the border to the safety of their own land. And this they did. And in doing so, they also caught and killed two of the Midianite princes in the process. What a night! What a victory! What a scene! Against huge odds, God had given Gideon the victory in a miraculous, special way. The Midianites had been slain, and those that remained had been scattered far and wide and chased by the men of Israel. Now, as we draw to a close, boys and girls, you might be thinking, what has this story got to do with me? Well, firstly, those of you who are tuned in today who are saved, there's a lesson for you. Because no matter how grave the situation is, no matter how large the opposition is that you face, you can say like the Apostle Paul, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. As a Christian, all you need to do is simply trust and obey like Gideon. And the Lord will do all the rest when problems come your way, when you're faced with great opposition. Secondly, and sadly, However, for perhaps for a boy or girl tuned in today who's unsaved, it's entirely a different matter. Because as you continue on in your sin, you're just like those Midianites. As they lay there in the darkness, sleeping and slumbering, thinking that all was well, thinking that they could in the morning have whatever they wanted, steal and take and bully. And they knew that they felt that they would never have to face the consequences of their sinful behaviour. And in defiance to God, they never imagined that he would suddenly step in and judge them for their sin. But he did. And you need to be careful of that. Because if the truth of the matter is this. As it was for the Midianites, so it will be for all who are still in their sin. God will suddenly one day take a dealing with those who have rejected him, who have refused his offer of mercy, who go on in their sin. And do that which is wrong. Either through a tragic untimely death. Or if the Lord was suddenly to come back again. You are like those Midianites. You're sleeping. You'll be caught out. And then when that moment comes. Be too late to repent. Too late to seek after God. For in the blink of an eye. You'll be cut off. And sadly cast into that awful place called hell forever. A place from which there is no return. Oh, don't be foolish today. Don't hold out. Don't continue on as you are in your sin. Don't be rebellious. Rather, come to the Saviour. Confess your sin. Put things right with God just now, before it is forever too late. The Bible says God takes no delight in the death of the wicked, nor is he willing that any should perish, but that all should come on to him in repentance. And we trust and pray that you will come to him today, Be wise. Do it in the closing moments, even of this meeting, before it is forever too late. May God bless these few thoughts to your heart. Let's just close our meeting in a little word of prayer. Dear Lord, we come to thee in our Saviour's name. And we thank thee for this wonderful story about the life of Gideon. And we think of all the lessons 
Gideon, just an ordinary man, filled with fear and doubt, had to trust in the Lord, had to take his stand, had to go through with God, and what a victory he had. And we would pray, O oh Lord, today that young boys and girls, mums and dads, would have those same victories because they have trusted in the Lord. They're living for him. They're putting him first. We think of those perhaps who are not saved. And like the Midianites, they're half asleep. They're not aware of what's going on. They're living in their sin and not realizing that God could come at any moment and to judge and to deal and to punish. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you'll waken them up and you'll draw them unto thyself and you'll save them even today. These things we ask in our Saviour's wonderful and precious name. Amen. Boys and girls, it's hard to believe, but that's us all done for another day. I hope you've really enjoyed this week's Bible Corner. We have really enjoyed presenting the story and bringing it all to you. And we trust that it's been a blessing to your heart. Now you look out for the little worksheet that's going to be put up at the end. You can download that and then I want you to see how much of you can get through it with regards to this wonderful story about Gideon today. Now, if you would like to get in touch with us about what you've heard in this story, or maybe you have got some concern about your own salvation, you know, you can leave us a comment, or you can send us a message on Messenger, and we will endeavour to get back to you as soon as possible. Now, don't forget, boys and girls, that if you have missed any of our Bible Corners already, you can go back at any time. You can go onto Facebook or YouTube, and you can watch all your favourites. And it's always something to do if you get a wet Sunday afternoon. We trust that there'll be a blessing to you. And guess what? Why don't you also invite some of your friends to watch them as well? So until the next time, when we're back with another Bible Corner, goodbye from all the team here at FPC Kids. <laughs>